Are you guys ready to go for a ride? Okay, let's go. My first trip to Rwanda came in 2008. I was traveling with a delegation of Villanova faculty to see what Catholic Relief Services was doing in that post-conflict society. Now, that's, that could be the subject of a TED Talk in and of itself, but my agenda was slightly different from my colleagues. You see, I study perpetrators of genocide. Now, this, uh, and so at my request, and through the political savvy of our Rwandan translator and friend, Gloriosa, she and I were able to gain admission into Rwanda's largest prison, called 1930, after the year in which it was built by the Belgian colonists. During that afternoon, we were able to record several hours of testimony from two convicted perpetrators of the genocide. Now, as that prison meeting room darkened, because we had lost power and the evening was setting in, a light went on inside my head. Now, I realize that there are a lot of historical complexities here, so I'm just going to say this simply. I came to realize for the first time that by the time of the genocide, many, many people were completely convinced that the only way to keep themselves and their family and their country safe was through the elimination of every single Tutsi. Now, of course, this was the result of a decades-long propaganda machine designed explicitly to convince them of a Tutsi conspiracy to destroy the Hutu. But by the 1990s, this invented myth had taken on a reality of its own. And in this isolated, intense environment of extreme intimidation and fear and self-victimization, uh, genocide became thinkable in Rwanda. And in April of 1994, the nightmare stepped into daylight, and nearly one million Tutsi and moderate Hutu were slaughtered in less than 100 days. And this was the beginning of my journey and my work to try and figure out the puzzle of atrocity by learning how to think genocidally. Now, thinking genocidally is difficult to do. You have to get beyond the conventional wisdom that genocide is man's inhumanity to man. You have to confront and accept that nothing that a human being can do can ever be called non-human. You have to push back against the impulse we have to, to monsterize perpetrators instead of understanding them. Now, granted, we can become so twisted that our hateful, violent actions can be unrecognizable to us, and it can provide us moral comfort to call someone inhuman because then the monsters are out there and not us. But it does nothing to outsmart the kind of, the kind of violence that leads to genocide. You see, we have got to find a new way to start thinking about this stuff because, frankly, folks, we did not do a very good job of stopping genocide and atrocity in the 20th century. From the Armenians in 1914 to Nazi Germany in World War II, Cambodia in 1978, Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1995, and, of course, Rwanda in 1994. And now we are already deep into the, to a new century with no real different insight into how to stop genocide and, ha and stop it from happening. And this is because of a foundational misunderstanding that we have about the roots of genocide. See, most of us believe that genocide starts with hate. But what if I was to tell you that the reason we are able to commit such gross atrocity against other people is precisely because of our innate desire to make deep, intense, loving relationships with other people? Now, this may seem counterintuitive to you, and it probably even a little offensive, but walk with me on this. This new understanding has not only changed the way I think about genocide prevention, it has transformed the way, we th way I think about our shared human nature. So let's start at the beginning, our real beginning. For my money, there is no clearer window into the human spirit than through the eyes of a baby but it is very difficult to know what is, goes on inside those oversized heads. <laughs> but luckily, there has been some very clever research that is beginning to unveil the moral universe of babies. And here's what we're finding out. We are wired from birth to connect. We are wired to be social. From the moment we take our first breath, we gravitate toward the human face, especially the eyes. Didn't you ever wonder how a newborn baby even knows what a human face looks like? And we also smile before we even know what a smile is. Even in utero, the body practices the smile. The smile may be the single most important thing that a newborn infant does. 
And for the record, that is not gas. <laughs> I've had four children. That is the gassy look. <laughs> but this is not all fun and games. Actually, this is a matter of life and death for a vulnerable little infant that's going to need more care and love and attention than most grown-ups are willing to, to put out. Unless, of course, we fall in love with the little things, which we do. We can't help it. How do babies do this to us? Well, beyond just being so adorable, researchers are finding out that we exhibit what they refer to now as hyper-cooperative behavior. We are a hyper-cooperative species. In 2006, Wernicke and Tomasello conducted a comparative study which compared helping behaviors in young chimps, our closest evolutionary uh, relative, and helping behavior in young children. Here is an example of helping behavior in a young chimp. You see he's dropped a lid, and if the researcher grasps enough and reaches out for it, eventually once the chimp is finished, tasting it, he gives it back. Uh, chimps can be cooperative, um, unless of course it's food, which chimps will eat without hesitation. But with we humans, it is different, radically different. This next clip illustrates the, the, the huge difference we have from even our closest relative. Now, you should know in this scenario, there, um, there's a picture in picture, and the researcher's hanging out some laundry to dry, and he has a clothespin that he accidentally drops in front of him, and he can't reach down, he can't reach it because the clothesline is in the way. And you should also know that this is completely spontaneous uh, behavior. This is not rehearsed at all. Watch the baby's eyes. Watch the way he negotiates this situation. Let's take a look. There goes the clip. Oh. 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 Mission accomplished. Do you see that we not only have the ability to read the intentions of another person, we also have the innate, the innate desire to shape our behavior to help another person uh, reach their goals or solve their problem. By the way, if the researcher placed the clip on the ground and made no move to pick it up, baby did nothing at all because there's nothing to do. Right? This is so ingrained in us that we take it for granted, but we should not. We do not come into this world either as blank slates or as untamed little savages. We come into this social game already knowing the fundamental rules of how to belong. And we do this through helping behavior. These little kids don't know why they're doing this, but we know that it works. Your reaction to seeing that behavior, oh, <laughs> just proves the point. There is nothing more attractive to us than helping behavior. In this next clip, Watch the baby's eyes and watch how he uh, reads the intention of the, of the researcher and also just notice how much fun he's having. Does it check? And stacks. <laughs> this one takes a little longer because I think he's wondering, does this guy even know how to stack books? <laughs> And by this point, he just oh. feels sorry for the guy. <laughs> this, is, this is not unusual behavior, right? All, all children do this. But this presents something of a problem for us, because if we are so hyper-cooperative, then how could we ever have a genocide? Wouldn't we all rush to help the people who are in need of our help, the, the targets of the violence? Well. That all depends on who you think you're helping. You see, we only tend to help people that we know, people that we feel connected to, our family, our kin, our clan. As much as none of us in this room would ever want to admit that we would ever help anyone with malicious or ill intent, history paints a very different picture. But this actually makes the question even sharper can we see genocide as an example of extreme helping behavior? Frankly, yes. 
but as long as you include one other factor. And this is an important element that can actually distort our hyper-cooperative behavior almost beyond recognition. And that is the phenomenon of fear. See, fear is an instinct that, for the most part in our evolutionary history, has served us very well. Fear is, is life-preserving. It is vital for our survival. Whether innate or learned, fear leads to better, safer behavior. But if that fear is extended, and, and, and we can't get rid of it, then it can have disastrous effects on our actions and judgment. And that is because fear is very uncomfortable for us. Psychologically, we want fear to go away as quickly as possible. But if we are unable to make the fear go away, or the fear is extended or invented, then we get moved to anger, and then anger turns to hate, and hate can turn to violence against the source of what we believe to be the source of that very uncomfortable feeling called fear. And this is why I can say that genocide does not start with anger. It grows out of fear. You see, we don't fight the things that we hate. We only fight the things we fear. Let me say that again. We only fight the things we fear. And we only fear those things or people that we believe can take something essential from us, mainly our security in all its forms, our personal security, our emotional security, our sexual security, our financial security, our eternal security, etc. But why does fear have this effect on us? Well, this is where neuroscience can actually shine a light on how our brains process and store fear and why we feel so out of control when it comes to fear. It, it turns out that the way our bodies store fear and the images that go with it is different from the way it stores other images with other emotions. There are regular memories, and then there are what is called fear memories. And the important thing to know about fear memories is that they are not stored in the upper neocortex of, of, of our brains that we usually associate with higher, more conscious, more executive functions of the brain. Fear memories are processed and stored in the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is part of our midbrain, and from an evolutionary standpoint, the midbrain is a more ancient part of our brain. It is more fast-acting, it is more effective. And the reason why fear memories are, are mostly unconscious to us is precisely so that they can be acted upon quickly without too much thinking getting in the way. See, our bodies apply more emotional value to fear memories precisely because it believes that fear memories are the memories that can keep us safe and alive. And it is no small tragic irony that while this fear mechanism may have served us well as hunter-gatherers and more isolated groups that, that didn't really have a lot of exposure, in a more modern, connected, open, multicultural, diverse world, it has done us no favors. We are becoming a jumpy species, living too much of our lives out of our ever-expanding amygdala. And yes, your amygdala can actually grow with repeated exposure to fear. Because neurologically, fear is an allergy that gets worse with repeated exposure. You do not become immune to fear. You become obsessed with it. And you can get caught in what is known as a fear loop. And this is a self-fulfilling loop where the world becomes a dangerous place full of threat and, and, uh, and uh, danger. And the, the, this is made worse because our brains can't tell the difference between invented fear and real fear. You see, we're just as able to make uh, fear memories out of our imagination as we are out of the stuff of the real world. You see, from a neurological standpoint, the chemicals involved the processes involved are exactly the same. Our brains have to trust that we're telling it the truth. So if you get this combination of an extreme fear that won't go away, and you couple it with that hyper-cooperative drive to, to help people in our group, especially when they are in danger, then you get a toxic cocktail that can lead straight to genocide. For better or for worse, folks, we are a highly social being, highly social animal that seeks to make deep, intense, loving relationships with one another. But we also know that if we think that we, our group is under threat, we will go to extraordinary measures to make that threat go away and restore order and security to, our, to the group. It is both our greatest strength that we are able to bond so deeply, 
and our most tragic flaw, that that connection can be distorted and manipulated by fear to cause us to, to commit gross atrocities against people and groups that pose no real threat to us. But there is hope. So you see, the only time we're out of control of this fear mechanism is when we are ignorant of it. If we are aware of our human nature, if we are mindful of this tendency, then we can take control of our fear then you can quite literally and neurologically determine how our minds are made up. Now, confronting our human nature in genocide is not fun, but it is possible to interrupt the kind of fear that leads to anger and violence. Try this. Next time you're really angry at someone or angry at something, stop and ask yourself, what am I scared of? <laughs> I promise you that will stop your anger in its tracks, and that will initiate a very interesting internal dialogue. You see, knowing genocide demands that we know ourselves, but knowing ourselves through the lens of genocide can provide us an entirely new way of meeting the, the challenges on a global, national, and even personal level. Thank you very much.